out if we go to chapter 28. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Verse 28. Something stood out to me when I was uh, reading this scripture and just the Lord began to speak to my heart and I want to share that with you today and trust that God's going to speak to your heart. You know, the, the devil thinks he has the upper hand in these days, doesn't he? He, he really does. Uh, he, he has convinced himself that he has the church right where he wants them. And he's convinced himself that there won't be revival. There won't be miracles in the last days. And the sad thing is he's convinced a lot of people that go to church the same thing. But I want you to know that he's the father of lies. Amen. And any anything that's spoken contrary to the word of God is a lie. It is not true. The Bible says his word is settled, settled in heaven. Now, when you settle something, it's over. Amen. Like if you go to court and you have a settlement, it's over. It's finished. You come to terms, you figure it out. And once the judge signs all the papers, it's done. Well, guess what? He has settled his word. You can't add to it, the Bible says, and you cannot take away from it. But because that's what we do, look what we're going through today. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says if you add to the word or if you take from the word, isn't this amazing? He said all of the plagues that are in the Bible, they're going to come your way. They're going to come upon planet Earth. Don't you find that very interesting? But he is a liar. Amen. So let's look at Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verse 28. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. We want to welcome those that are worshiping online. We hope you'll be here next Sunday. We understand sometimes you can't be here, but we want to have you in the house of God next Sunday. We're going to just see God do great things. But we got church business right now. Let him that stole steal no more but rather him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth i gotta read the first part first again oh my goodness let him that stole steal no more let him that stole devil steal no more see there has to come a time in your life where where you have more of the blessings of God than the cursings of this life there has to come a point where you say enough is enough I'm not fooling around anymore I am making a full commitment to Jesus Christ I am all in and if I'm all in devil you can steal no more from me and that's my word this morning the message is steal no more more. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you asking you to anoint this word and anoint me as your servant. We thank God for the worship that's in this place. And Lord, we invite you, we invoke you, we, uh, we implore you to come, God, and minister in this house and touch every soul, God. We need a revival in the land. We need a revival in the church. And, and the devil has stolen too much and it's time to put some things back in Jesus name it's time to get back anointing it's time to get back the baptism of the Holy Spirit it's time to get back miracles and, and God it's time to see the church win souls and grow the church daily the Bible says Lord the, the enemy has stolen long enough and now it's time to say devil you can steal no more in Jesus Christ and everyone said amen Amen. Give the Lord another hand clap of praise as you're seated. Amen. Amen. This is probably going to be a message you're going to want to share. So I, I don't want you to be on your phones all service, but I give you a moment and share this one. Amen. You might be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. In fact, I'm going to share it right now. Even if, if I can share it while I'm preaching, you can share it while you're sitting there. Amen. Amen. Multitask. Now, I can't multitask a lot. I've told you about that, but I, that's one thing I can do. Praise the Lord. I have shared this illustration that I'm going to share with you um, a couple times in church, but some of you maybe that are newer to our ministry might not have heard this, um, this particular story, but it's extremely relevant 
to what I'm going to be preaching on today. It's my 13th birthday. Some of y'all remember this story. Some of you don't. My 13th birthday, um, I go to school. I'm excited. Uh, turning 13. Man, I'm a finally a teenager. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And I uh, go to school and ha had a good day and coming home on the bus. And um, remember, we, we lived back in the mountains up uh, in South Mountain. And uh, we lived over the mountain. And then when you got down the mountain, you had to turn left and go back a driveway. When I tell you I walked a half mile to my school bus, I walked a half mile to my school bus. I promise you. And, and I'm better for it today, I guess. I don't know. But uh, we lived back secluded, no neighbors for miles and miles and miles. There's a reason I'm telling you that. And so I, I, I'm coming home on the school bus. I'm one of the last people to get off of the bus. And um, I notice generally I walk home from the, down the lane and I walk to my house. But I notice that my, my mother is at the end of the driveway in her car. I thought, well, that's unusual, maybe something to do with my birthday, perhaps, I don't know. And so uh, I get off the school bus, and I see my mother crying profusely. She's just trembling and shaking and just just distraught. And, and then a lot of things go through your mind. What, what could it be? Did, did someone pass? Is someone in, injured? Did, what, what happened? And she could barely get the words out. And she was just overwhelmed with fear. I could just see the fear in my mother's eyes. And my mother's a strong woman, and I, I haven't seen that very often in her life. But she was frightened and scared. And, and I couldn't figure out, and I asked her what was wrong. And, and after a moment, she finally calmed down, and she said, Jay, we've been robbed. Someone's broke into our house. And you have to think, we're back in the middle of nowhere and I can't reconcile this. Someone came to the mountains to rob our house. And, and uh, so she, she begins to tell me the story. And the cops had showed up. And then we eventually got to go back into our house. And, 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 and I, I was fearful. And, and I saw the, the big footprint of a guy, a huge guy, that busted in a door and broke windows. And they stole things. And the house is just turned upside down. Th that's my recollection of turning 13. That, that was my experience, and, and the family made it good. You know, eventually we had a party, and it was fun and all that, but that remained in my mind, and, and, and here's, the, here's the trouble that, that we had. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this, but it's a frightening thing, and, and, and I'm, I'll tell you, I'm not afraid to tell you that as a 13-year-old boy, I was scared to death. I slept with my brothers and sisters for weeks. I mean, we were just all afraid. They're coming back. They know where we live now. They've told all the other criminals, and, and even the cops said, you know, make sure you got everything locked up. We don't know. They may or may not come back. And, and so we're, we're just fearful that, that they're going to come back, and they're going to want to steal more stuff, and they're going to want to do more harm to our family. And we were just we were overwhelmed with fear, and that took a while to get over that. But, but we were terrorized within our family. And... But, but what, I, what I do know is we realized that they got caught. They arrested them somewhere down in Chambersburg. They were put in prison. And, and boy, the relief just when you find out that someone that's maybe violated you or, or robbed you or whatever has been caught and they're shut up, there's just a sense of relief, right? The sense of relief that, that comes to your life. Well, I want you to know that that's the kind of fear that Satan will instill into your mind. See, he will, he will come in and he'll break into your house. Maybe not physically, but he'll break into your house. He'll break into your mind. And he'll begin to say things like, you're not good enough. And he'll say things like, you won't be successful. He'll begin to say things like, you can't survive this trial. He'll tell you all kinds of crazy things. But I want you to know he's been caught. He's been found out. Amen. He's been locked up. He's been chained up. Amen. And I want you to know he might have a little bit of power right now. But oh, the good news is one day Jesus Christ is coming again. Amen. And the Bible tells us that an angel is going to bind him and lock him up. Amen. And Lord Jesus, we've got victory in this house. Somebody give him praise if you believe that. Amen. That's good news. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be fearful. You're a child of God, by the way. Amen. You are a child of God. 
and you don't need to have uh, some type of surveillance system and cameras and videos and, and all these and alarms and that's all good you can do that and in this age I guess we have to do that but you've got someone that's watching over you all the time you, the Bible says his eye is upon you and he sees you and he sees everything that's around you he sees everything that's going on in you and around you he's got his eye on you and here's what the Bible says John chapter 10 verse 10 says the thief comes not but what to steal to kill and to destroy but look at the look at the rest of the verse I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly see Jesus said I came to give you your life back I came to give you your life back back some of you need to get your life back amen so, some of you you used to be happy but you're not happy some of you used to have joy but you don't have joy some of you used to have passion to worship Jesus but the passion is gone but the enemy has tried to steal things from you but God says I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly amen but Satan does have a purpose amen the Bible does say he's the prince of the power of the air. And so he's working. He does have a domain. He does have a, a little bit of, of power upon planet Earth. He, he has that, that reign. He's the prince of the power of the air. And, and he focuses to steal and to take whatever he can have. He, he wants to take anything that he can have because, see, he was cast out of heaven. Amen. And now he can't have the blessings of God. God kicked him out. Look what Revelation 12 says in verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called what? The devil and Satan who deceives the world. He, he was cast to the earth. His angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of Jesus Christ has come. Look what he says. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Isn't that good? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto death. I want you to know he, he has uh, some authority within the air. He's the prince of the power of the air. He, he comes and he deceives. He comes and he lies. But it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Listen, listen, sometimes I feel like preaching this morning. See, sometimes you got to testify to yourself. Amen. I mean, you could plead the blood of Jesus Christ, and we ought to do that. And I, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over my family and over my children and over my life and over this ministry. I plead. But, but sometimes when the devil begins to speak, he's the prince of the power of the air. He's spiritual. And he begins to speak and speak and speak. And I have to just look at him and say, devil, you're a liar. Look what the Lord has done. Devil, do you remember when he helped me pay my bills when I didn't have a job? You're a liar. Devil, do you know how he's kept me healthy and you've told me I won't be healthy? You need to testify to yourself and say, I don't care if you got to go back to 1965 and say, in 1965, God did this. And if he did that then, he can do it right now. Amen. Come on and give him praise if you believe that. Amen. You got to testify to yourself sometimes. See, Christians, we, we need to realize that we're in a spiritual war in this world. You, you, you can't see it, but but. There are devils all around. There are devils, spirits. We don't like to talk about that. Do you know there are spirits that are assigned to regions? Just, just read the Bible. It's, it's very easy to, to hear. There, there are regions, and there's, there's, I'll even go further. There are devils assigned to your family. And there are devils that are attached to you and you're, in the sense that they're assigned to you, not, not attached to you. I want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. And, and, and their assignment is to tear you down and use your vulnerabilities and use your weaknesses. They, they know how you're weak. You, you know how when you, uh, I don't know if you ever watch boxing, but when you watch boxing, the, the, you know, there are some fighters that aren't as talented and aren't as strong and, and they should not be able to win a match. But, but the reason that they can win a match is they'll look at someone that's stronger and see their vulnerability. And when the moment presents itself, they'll seize the opportunity and they'll knock that joker out. And see, that's, that's what the enemy does to you. He sees your vulnerabilities. 
He sees your weaknesses and, and he wants to try to destroy you and he's fighting against you. And there's a, there's a spiritual struggle. I wish you could see it. There's a spiritual fight going on in this place, even right now. And he doesn't want you to grow in God's favor. He doesn't want you to grow in God's blessings. God wants to bless you beyond your capability to even think about it. Look what the Bible says. I've seen this happen in my life so many times. I've seen some things happen recently where Michelle and I have talked, and I'll scratch my head, and I'll say, can you believe this? I mean, really, can, can you believe what God is doing? And sometimes we'll just look and, and almost chuckle and say, I, I don't know how that happened. But look what he says in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. Actually, I do know how it happens. With blessing, I will bless you. And with multiplying, I love this verse, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Oh, that's a good word right there. Because we focus on all the blessings, but he said, that's great. You're going to be blessed. You're not even going to be able to contain it. You're not even going to be able to imagine it. But he says, when you get to the end of the scripture, it says, your descendants, your children, your children's children, your children's children's children, they're going to go and possess the gates of their enemies. You're going to be successful. You're going to make it. Because God said in his word, you're going to make it. But, but Satan is the master of reduction and stealing. That's his job. And he comes in and he tries to just take and steal and take and steal. And, and often he's stripping Christians of their God-given right to be blessed. He's, he's stripping them of their opportunity to live the abundant life. And the reason why a lot of people don't get to the abundant life is because they get and then they lose. Then they get, then they lose. They get a little victory and then they get a little down. They get a little help and then they get a little sick. And then they, it's just this vicious cycle where they get and they receive a great anointing, but they lose it. And we go through this cycle, getting and losing and getting and losing. And Haggai chapter 1 verse 6 says it like this. You've sown much and bring in little. You eat and do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but are not warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes. That's a powerful scripture right there. A bag with holes. Let, let me just ask you, does your life have holes in it? Because God's pouring in, but it's seeping out. Because you have some holes you got to fix in your life. I, I need to preach that sometime. Amen. I'm, I'm going to write that down. Somebody text me. i got to preach on this scripture because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach it. It's like we have holes in our lives. And we had a great... You, you hear people to say, well, you know, it used to be great back in 1976. I'm telling you, we had the, all, the most awesome revival. The church was packed and, and the anointing and people were baptized with the Holy Ghost and healed and all that. Well, what happened? You should have built upon that. Amen. I mean, you, you should, oh, and maybe it was another time period in your life where, Lord, man, he was just blessing me, you know, back in 1996. Let me tell you what happened. Oh, man. Well, where are you now? Because did, did you allow holes in your life? And you're getting it, but you're losing it. And you're getting it. Oh, this is good word right here. Amen. You're getting and you're losing. And you're getting and you're losing. And you'll never be the abundant life because you have been reduced so often in your life. It's like you take two steps forward and take six steps backwards. You know, does that make sense? I can remember playing football, and I've shared a lot of illustrations. Um, but I, I loved football when I was... Uh, when I was younger, and uh, man, I was in Pee Wee football, and I was just fortunate enough to be fast. And man, they just, they just said, give, give him the ball and make a couple blocks and just see what you can do. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. You know, that's just that's how it is in sports. But I tell you, there there were some games where I'd score like a whole bunch of touchdowns. But I tell you, sometimes I'd get that ball, and I'd be huffing and puffing. I'm like, where is the goal line? Did they move it at halftime? Because it seems like it's just longer and longer. And I, I'm wore out here, coach. You've been running me all these plays, and I'm tired and, and this and that. I, I think now instead of 100 yards, it's 200 yards. Did you move the goal line? And that's almost what life seems like. Did they move the goal line on me? Because I feel like I'm making a little bit of progress. And then all of a sudden, when I feel like I'm making progress, I take all these steps backwards. 
And then when I finally make that progress again, that goal line isn't where it was. It's way up there now. i got to work harder. I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. Sometimes life seems like it gets harder. Sometimes life seems like a chore. Sometimes it's hard to get out of bed. How many say amen? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just choose when you stay in bed and when you get out of bed? Oh, man, that'd be wonderful. Like, now nah, I'm just, I'm not feeling it today. So I'm, I'm just going to hang out. I'm going to watch some TV. I'm not even going to change my, bah- my pajamas. I may not even brush my teeth today. I'm just staying in bed. And, and your employer would be okay with that. And you just get to choose, right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? You just get to choose. You know, I'm just, I'm just not feeling this Monday. How many struggle on Mondays sometimes after the weekend? It's like, oh, some of you don't. That's all right. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just, you're not feeling that Monday. You're like, okay, I'll, I'll just take the day off today. And sometimes we have that luxury. But you can't take off of life. Life is a chore. Life is hard sometimes. And you've got to grind and you have to, you have to get through it. And there are times in your life where you're wondering if life's going to get any better. Will my life ever turn around? Is it possible for me to ever be happy again? The answer to that question is yes. You can be happy again. You can be anointed again. You need to tell the devil, you can steal no more from me, devil. This is it. I've had enough. You cannot steal from me. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Hopefully you're getting something out of this. Not that I speak in regard of need. Listen to that. Not that I speak in regard of need. Need. We, we focus so much on our need. But he says, I've learned in whatever state that I am to be content. So I understand not all my needs will always be met. But I can always be content. I'm going to say that again. My need, the stuff in my life, the material things, the physical, tangible things might not all be all right, but I can always be content. How many of you like being around mean, hateful, complaining people? Isn't that wonderful? I mean, they're the first people you want to go to lunch with and just fellowship with and just hear how bad life is. You want to hear how good the devil's doing in their lives. You know what I'm talking about? You know people like this. I know you do it. We all do. And, and I'm telling you, you get around people like that, and boy, it just, it just bring you down because they're just always down, and they're off, and they're struggling. and they're this. I'm like, it, it, did God do anything for you today? Can you find one thing you can be happy about? What, what, can you find anything to be content about? I mean, you carry that nice Bible and you quote the Scriptures, but you seem miserable. I preached a message. I should dust it off and preach it again. It was, it was titled, Saved but Miserable. That doesn't even make sense to me. How, how can you be saved and miserable? But I know people like that. Curtis, you've been in ministry. Pastor Lewis, you've been in ministry. Pastor Kales, you're watching. You've been in ministry. And, and, and you have seen people... I mean, they'll just shout all over the church. They know the words to every single song. Every songs I never even heard of. And clap and raise your hands. They'll even give and they'll be faithful and they'll come to church. But outside of church, they're miserable people. And and, and you've you've come to church, but you've never let church get in you. That's the problem. Amen. Amen. You come to church, but church hasn't come into you. And, and we need to learn how to be spiritually saturated. I'm, I'm going to preach on that one day. That's another thing I'm thinking about. But, but some people look at this scripture that I just quoted. Listen to this. Not that I speak in regard of need. He's not talking about need. But he's saying, I know how to be content. Content. Does that make sense? And so some people look at this scripture and they try to reason to themselves about the be content part so they try to learn how to be content learn how to be content learn okay so when i'm in need i need to learn how to be content okay i need to learn how to be content 
And so when I read this scripture, there are some people that it has a reverse effect on. A reverse effect. Because contentment can be good or bad for you. Sometimes we think contentment is this. Well, it's never going to get any better. I guess I just accept my lot in life. Pastor told me I need to get content. So I just got to accept it. This woe is me. What did Michelle say? The ER Christian, that's me. Pastor told me just to suck it up and live with it. That, that's what he's telling me. I need to look. No, no, no. You're not understanding. See, I, contentment can be very, very confusing. Some people say, I don't see my condition or my situation improving, so I must just have to live with this, and, and I'm going to condition myself to accept life the way that it is, and so I'm just going to learn to live with this and say, well, God, it must be your will that I lay here by the pool for 38 years and watch everybody else get healed, but I'm just going to sit here and be lazy. I want you to know the devil is a liar, amen? He can steal no more, and I want you to know your breakthrough's on the way. God is going to turn this thing around. He turned it around for Ruth and did an amazing thing, amen? He turned it around for Hannah and had her breakthrough. He turned it around for Job. Job should have just looked at life and said, I give up, I can't do this, I've lost everything. But God turned it around. How many of you believe God's going to turn it around? Raise your hand and say, oh God, I need you to turn it around in this place hallelujah because we don't know what contentment is I'm, I'm going to show you a thing here in a moment all right I don't doubt it's your desire to grow in God I don't question that you want to try to get ahead in life but there has to be a paradigm shift in your mindset where you finally stand up and you say enough is enough I'm taking control of my life. I'm taking my life back. I'm taking my family back. I'm taking my ministry back. I'm taking it all back, devil, in Jesus' name. I came to tell you, devil, you can steal no more from me from this day forward. Amen. Now, now, th this is really what I wanted to get to, and then I have a couple points to share at the end. I want to preface in this part of the message to let you know your, your stuff is fair game for the devil. All your stuff. Your clothes, your car, your house, your job. All the stuff you can touch and feel and get. And the, the things that we just kill ourselves trying to get more of. Amen? That's all fair game to the devil. I want to show you something. See, often we, we measure the good life and the blessed life by what we have. And there's nothing wrong with having. I, I hope you get all you can out of this life. I want you to have as much as you can get financially and otherwise. If God blesses you, go for it. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. Because the, the more God blesses you, the more you can bless someone else. That's just the way I look at life. Now, if you can't handle the blessing, you ain't going to get the blessing. Well, that's another message. So, often we measure the good life based on the material things, but I want you to know the material things can be gone like that. Gone. It's temporary. That's exactly right. It's temporary. And, and that's why you need to look at things like this because God's okay with you losing your stuff. Here's my question. Are you mature enough as a child of God for him to let down the hedge so the devil can have your stuff? Amen? And he may or may not take your stuff. But I want you to know if he does or if he does not, I'm still a child of God. That's why I don't base my contentment upon need because he can take it or not take it but I'm still content does that make sense Hosea chapter 5 verse 15 let me say it like this I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense oh my goodness 
then they will seek my face and not my hand. That's not what it says, but that's my version. They'll seek my face, and then in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. That's an interesting scripture, isn't it? Because you have no idea what I'm going to say next, so you've got to be careful if you say that's an interesting scripture or not, right? I looked at this, and I said, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. And I wrote this down. I wonder, have we offended God by how we measure what being blessed is? Have we offended God? Because, see, I don't serve God for the stuff I have. I serve God for the God I have. Amen? I don't serve Him for the stuff. Because if you serve Him for the stuff, when the stuff's not there... You won't be content. You're going to lose your mind. You're going to get upset. You're going to be that person no one wants to have lunch with. Isn't that true? I don't serve God for the stuff. I serve God because I was empty and He filled me up. I serve God because I was lost but now I'm found. I serve God because I was on my way to hell but now my name's recorded in the Lamb's book of life and I'm saved and I know that I am. The most important thing you can have is your salvation. That's, I believe, what that scripture is telling us. Have we offended God because of how we measured blessings? Look what Philippians uh, 4, chapter 11 says. Now, let me say it again. Not that I speak in regard of need, for I've learned in whatever state to be content. I'm not worried about the stuff. I'm content with Jesus. How many of you know Jesus is enough? Jesus is enough for me. His anointing's enough for me. His Holy Spirit's enough for me. His uh, word is enough for me. He, his anointing and his blessings, they're all enough for me. That's why Psalms 55 verse 22 says, Cast your burden upon the Lord. He'll sustain you there. And he will never suffer the righteous to be moved. He didn't say you might not lose some things, but he says your soul will be steadfast and your soul cannot be moved. Amen. Man, I want you to know I'm content with Jesus today. So now knowing that, know, knowing that, I'm not going to lose my mind if I lose my car. I'm not going to lose my mind if I lose my job. One door closes, one door opens. You know, that's just how it is. I, that's how I live life. I'm not worried about stuff and things. If, if, if There are more important things to worry about than your stuff. You've got a soul you got to get to heaven. And you got a family you want to take with you. And you got to fight devils that are assigned to your home and, and to your community and to, to this region. you got to be fighting devils. So don't, don't worry about the stuff. Stuff comes and stuff goes. Isn't, isn't that the truth? It just does. And you're going to go through seasons, and, and it may or may not be your fault. If you've sinned and messed up, accept it. It's your fault. Move on and make it right. If it's not your fault, then know God's with you, and it's all okay. But there's going to be ups and downs in life with stuff. I mean, that's just the way that it is. And, and so I won't lose my mind when I lose my stuff. I won't get mad at God when I lose my stuff because as long as I got King Jesus. Don't need, no, you know the song. Anybody else know the song, Dotty Peoples? We just wore that song out, didn't we, Katie? I mean, Michelle wore it out. Other people that sang it, they just wear that song out. I mean, if you wanted to have revival, you just put dotty peoples on. You just let them start singing, long as they got King Jesus. You all remember that, don't you? Wanda, we wore that song out. And I'm so glad we did because it has permeated my soul. And as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nothing else. I don't need nobody. I don't need no thing. As long as I got King Jesus. See, see that's why, man, I feel the Lord today in this place. Job chapter 2 verse 9 says this. You remember when he lost it all? He says, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Why would you live right now? Why would you be a man of integrity? She said, curse God and die. Just be done with God. Look what the next verse says. Then he goes on and says, but he said, you speak like a foolish woman speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God 
And shall we not accept adversity? And in all this, he did not sin with his lips. Boy, that's interesting that you can sin with your lips. I got a whole bunch of messages today. I got material now for the next month and a half. We're going to preach that too. Listen to this. In all of that, he lost it all. I'm talking about this man lost it all in a mere moment. All of his livelihood, his business, all of his cattle, all of his herds were gone in a moment. Do you know if you if you look up uh, Job and you'll study Bible scholars, you'll find out that that he was he was more than a millionaire back then in Bible days. That's amazing. Not that that's important, you know, but but still that's amazing that he he had done that through all of his business dealings. And he lost it all in a moment. And then his ten children died. And obviously his marriage is falling apart. I mean, he's losing it all. And, 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 and what he understands is the scripture that says, um, The Lord knows the way that I will what? Choose or take. He says, When I go through the fire, he knows I'll come forth as gold. In other words, he, he knows, my, he knows my, my makeup. He knows that I'm not so attached to the stuff, so if I lose the stuff, I won't lose him. He knows my soul. And listen to this. This is so good. If God can trust you to sometimes lose some stuff but be faithful when you lose it, he'll give you more than you had the first time. Amen to that. But if you got holes in your bag, and if you got holes in your life, I, I can't answer for you. But if you'll tie a knot, and if you'll just sew up all those holes, and you'll shore up your life, and you'll be faithful at all times when you have or you don't have, I'm telling you, He can bless you beyond your capability to understand. Amen. So, so I want you to know the devil can have my stuff if he wants, but he can steal no more. Now wait, wait a second. It doesn't make sense. You're telling me I give the devil permission to take my stuff, but you're telling me he can't steal from me. That's kind of confusing, isn't it? Hmm. Steal no more. You can have my stuff, but you can't steal no more from me. Because we have to understand there are certain things he cannot have. There are thir certain things the devil cannot have. He, he can have this nice blue jacket. Could care less. He can have the house, the car. He can have it all. But there's certain things he cannot steal. And the first thing that I want you to know that you need to protect the most is, is your salvation. Salvation for your soul. And you can't have it anymore, devil. Now, if I say steal no more, for some of you, maybe he has been stealing it. Do you know you can lose your salvation? We don't preach this enough anymore. I, I want to be a word preacher through and through, through and through. You can lose your salvation. Now, I'm not talking about you messed up and you did something you shouldn't do and now you regret it and you prayed and asked God to forgive you. Been there, done that. All of us. And all the hypocrites said amen to? No. <laughs> Act like you never make a mistake? No, we all make mistakes. Good grief. I'm talking about severing your religion, just losing it, totally going back on the Lord. And, and, and I want you to know that you can backslide on God. Do you know how many people in the church world don't even know that word backslide today? Isn't that awful? Hosea chapter um, 11 verse 7 says this my people are bent on backsliding from me though they call to the most high none have exalt his exalt him that's interesting I praise but I'm not exalting him look what Exodus chapter 32 32 says yet now if you will forgive their sin but if not I pray blot me out of your book which has book which you have written and the Lord said to Moses whoever has sinned against me I will blot him where out of my book do you know there are a whole bunch of books where God's keeping a ledger 
and there is the Lamb's Book of Life. And when you stand before the judgment seat and Jesus before Jesus Christ, they're going to go through the book and say, are you here? Because remember, there were a lot of people that said, well, didn't you know, God, we cast out devils? We did miracles. We healed in your name. We were just talking about this scripture on Thursday. And we did all of this. And what does he say? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't even know you. You're not in the book. Maybe you were in the book at one time, but I got some spiritual white out, and your name was blotted out because you're not serving me any longer. This is a good word right here. You need to hear me because you need to be very, very careful. There are a lot of things, devil, you can have all of the stuff. I don't care about that. But you need to be careful because you can allow Satan to steal the most important thing that you possess, and that's your relationship relationship with God amen first Corinthians 10 and 12 says therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall I don't want anybody in this place to fall I don't want anybody in this place backslidden and not have the opportunity to give their hearts to Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit convicts them and draws them. This is what we need to be preaching to this world. Because everybody's a Christian today. Everybody, you know this to be true. Yeah, I know about God. Well, do you know about God or do you know God? <laughs> big difference. Big, big difference. I remember that I was uh, I was preaching in Camp Hill. Uh, I was there for a, a Sunday, and the Lord just directed me in a very kind of unusual way. And I started preaching on backsliding, and um, and my the Lord moved, and we had some people get saved. It was wonderful. And the pastor said, uh, "We have a visiting uh, preacher here that wants to talk to you." Sometimes that can be good, but who knows, right? And so um, this, this preacher uh, comes up to me and he says, I, I've been in the ministry and now I'm retired, but I've been in the ministry for over 50 years and I've never heard anything like that. And I was like, okay, here it comes. And he's, he's, he's just going to pick it apart and he's going to tell me, you know, I'm wrong and this and that. And, and uh, he, tears started streaming down his eyes. I'll never forget it as long as I live. He says, I preached in an organization for over 50 years, once saved, always saved. And he says, for 50 years, I was wrong. God just convicted me in that message. That's amazing. You need to, and, and, and we, we prayed and just tears were flowing. It was, it, was, it was an absolutely wonderful experience. Because when you get someone that, I don't, I don't, that tend to like to use the word indoctrinated, but it's the best I come up with. Kind of indoctrinated for 50 years, it's hard to convince them they were wrong. You have to maintain your relationship with Jesus Christ every single day. Now, be careful how you ask this question or answer this question, okay? It's a loaded trick question. I'm just going to give you that in advance, all right? It's a loaded trick question. How many people are saved in this place? Be careful. Don't be so quick to answer that question. Because the Bible says, see, we use that word saved, and I understand why and how we use it about salvation, right? I understand that. But we use it so flippantly. But the Bible says this, those that un door to the end you will be saved now yes how many people saved in this place I am saved and I know that I am in this moment right now I am saved I hope I'm saved an hour from now I hope you're still serving God after lunch today I hope I hope when you go to bed tonight you're still being saved and you're going to have to endure a whole lot of stuff. And what happens is some people give in to all that they endure and they backslide on God. There's a story in Luke chapter 15. We won't get into it, but it's about the prodigal son and how the prodigal son inherits and he leaves and he spends all of his money and he leaves the father. It's symbolic of his relationship with the father. And, 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 and basically.
basically he was there with the pigs, eating with the pigs. He finally came to himself, sense, and senses, and he goes home. And the father says, let's throw a party. My son that was lost is now found. My son that was blind now sees. And I want you to know you can lose your relationship with Jesus Christ, but the good news is you can get it back. Amen. You can get it back in Jesus' name. Humble yourself. Come and pray with us today. Pray with us online. And you can, you can uh, get your relationship back with Jesus Christ. He'll welcome you with, with open arms. The Bible says he's just and ready to forgive you. He wants to forgive you. You can get your relationship back. And then you need to finally sell out completely. And you need to look at the devil and say, Devil, you can have all my stuff. But you will steal no more my relationship with Jesus Christ. This is my moment to get it back. Amen. Okay, I got to finish up. That's, that's the first thing. That's the first thing you can look at him and say, you're not going to steal this ever again. No more. No more, devil. The, the second thing is you can, you can tell him you cannot steal my joy anymore. Because my joy is not attached to my stuff. My joy is attached to Jesus. Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Well, that, those are all good prayers. And then he says in verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you woke up happy? Just happy. Not rich not famous just happy having joy in your heart when's, when's the last time you came to church and you just worshiped the Lord you, you weren't worried about everything else around you, you just, you're just you saved and you know that you are and you have joy in your heart because some people oh Lord I, I meet him and wonder do you have any joy in your life can you remember a time in your life where you were happy a time in your life where you had Contentment, real contentment. Yet some people lose their joy. They let him steal your joy. But if you're saved, he is your joy. He's all you need. And he can't steal that from me if I don't allow him to. It's time to get back your joy and say, Lord, will you restore what I want you to have in my life again? It's kind of like how he says in, in Joel, I'll restore the years. The canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar has stolen, eaten up. Some of you haven't been happy for years and years. It's time to get it back and say, when I get it back, devil, you cannot steal it again. Last thing, and then we're going to pray. We've got our home music on. Before we go home, we're going to pray in this altar. What's the sense of having a good word if we're not going to pray? But the, the third thing, the third thing that I want you to look at the devil and say, you can steal no more is my anointing. My anointing. Too many people are getting and losing and getting and losing. It, it, it's like he has the, the horn and he's going to anoint David and he pours the oil down and, and God just pours his anointing on us and we have holes in our life. And we're losing it. We get it and we lose it. We get it and we lose it never get ahead in life, but you need to keep the anointing that God has given to you. You need to protect the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can lose the anointing. Did you know that? Samson, real quick, Samson, I mean, this guy's amazing. He's killing wild animals. He's killed a thousand of his enemies with the jawbone of a donkey. I mean, it's just over and over and over again. This guy does amazing things. H how does he do it? Remember, I told you I feel like that he was Pee Wee Herman. I really do. Because people kept asking, how, how do you do this? Judges chapter 13, verse 25 says, The Spirit of the Lord began to move on him. The Holy Spirit, the anointing moved on him. That's how he did what he did. That's how you do what you do. It's not because you're so gifted and great. It's because you're anointed. Thank God for your giftings. But, but your anointing will bring it to a whole other level. But, but, but we understand this, that he lost the anointing. The enemy will come in and steal your anointing if you allow him. But there's good news. Judges chapter 16 verse 28 says, Samson called to the Lord saying, Oh Lord, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray this one more time. 
that I may take him one blow and I may take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes that plucked out his eyes. The Bible says strength came back into that man and he pushed out on those pillars and the anointing came and the greatest victory for him came at the end. I want somebody to hear that. You might think that your life is over, but the greatest anointing can come right at the last part of your life. Amen. Stand with me all over this place. We're going to pray. I, th I think I got two more scriptures I want to quote. You got two more up there? Listen to this. Steal no more. Just, just make that declaration and look at these last two verses of, of David. When David lost uh, everything, I mean, he, he literally, they stole all their stuff. They took their wives. They took their children. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8, the Bible says this. So David inquired of the Lord and said, Shall I pursue this? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered and said, Pursue. For you, you're going to overtake them. And without fail, you're going to recover all. Wow, I like that scripture. So look at the next verse then. I think it's 19. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. For David had recovered all. Oh, would you raise your hands with me and say, God, it's time to recover. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm getting my salvation back. I'm getting my joy back. I'm getting my anointing back. I'm getting back everything the devil's stolen from me that I've given. And I'm about ready to take it back. Take it back. Take it back in Jesus' name. Oh, my. I feel the Holy Spirit in this house. Let's have a word of prayer as every head is bowed. And I want to ask a very serious question that we're going to open up this altar for everyone. If you're here in this place and you are not serving God, you've never prayed for salvation, or you once did serve the Lord, but you're not serving Him now, and you would like to come and pray and get your salvation back, make your commitment to the Lord, and become a child of God, would you raise your hand and I'll pray with you. Is there one? I'll pray with you. I'll trust God for you. salvation. Type that word into us new. We're going to pray for you. We're going to trust you. We'll trust God to make you new. If you're here today and you'd say, well, Pastor Jay, I have lost some things that I need to get back. I I've lost some joy. I've lost some anointing. I I've lost different things. Would you just raise your hand and wave at me and say, I need special prayer. Would you do that? Amen. God bless you. I see those hands. Amen. I see those hands. God bless you. Amen. Here's what I want to do. I want to open up this altar. We're going to get ready to pray one last prayer. And then when we do, I want you to come. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm trusting and believing you that this is a, a pivotal moment in our lives. That today we make this declaration that he'll steal no more from us. Oh, he can have stuff. That's not stealing. We just give that to him. But you cannot take my salvation. You cannot have my joy. And you cannot have my anointing. I make that declaration today. I stand on your word and I believe that I shall possess these things until the last day I'm on planet earth and I will endure to the end and be saved. In Jesus' name we pray this prayer and everybody said amen. I want to open up the altar. I want you to come. I hope everybody will come. Yes, sing that song. Come on. Come on. Step out from where you are. We need to all be in the altar praying. We need to seek God for strength.